uh, welcome. It's a very, very nice turnout. Nice to see everybody. You guys are in. You can't get out. <laughs> My name is Eric Chittenden. I'm president of the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. I'm here with a couple of our board members, uh, the three, uh, Sheila. Uh, my wife Francine, who's the treasurer, and Michael, Mike just stepped out. <laughs> Michael Bard, who's hiding somewhere. So there's Michael. Got a, hey, Michael, there he is. Eric, so, maybe you can introduce Ashley. Just Ashley Proto. Yes. here too. Oh yes, Ashley. Uh, Ashley Proto's here. I, I, Ashley's uh, attending at the Park College, and she's doing a. a a project with us on the invasive species this summer. So, welcome aboard, Ashley. Okay, we've got a, a lot to go over. It's going to be a really nice evening. I'm looking forward to this presentation myself. I haven't seen it. We have our, our Sheila is a very talented with this, these projects, and so uh, we always look forward to that. <clears throat> You know, when you look at the Waterbury Reservoir, it's uh, the eighth largest lake in Vermont. And what's kind of interesting is that many of the people who drive through town, and even Vermonters, don't realize it exists because you really can't see it except in certain days, maybe in the winter, as you go by. But it's uh, 860 surface er acres, and, uh, and technically it's, uh, it's, it's not a natural resource. It's a man-made uh, lake with a dam. so. But uh, I would have to say that it uh, would feel very unnatural, being an, un an unnatural resource. <laughs> I mean, it would really feel unnatural if it weren't here. It's a very beautiful book. So the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir uh, came together in the early 90s. And it, uh, then sort of we took a break. It was a very intense uh, a uh, few years when we first started, and then <clears throat> it, it, we it became, um, you know, came back to life, and uh, just after 2000. Eric, uh, so we'll have some. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, we we some of the people in the back can't hear you that well. Okay. People could uh, just project right. a little more. Sure. And uh, we're gonna have some time after the. Uh, presentation to answer questions and, and as you go around the, the reservoir there are just so so many different aspects to it first the dam itself is a it's quite a, a piece of work and it's been updated tremendously over the years and then you have the campsites you have uh, the different uh, you know uses of the reservoir so we as a, the friends uh, represent all the uh, legal and you know users of the reservoir. And a lot of the things that we've gotten into, the, you see the fish lot mine bin, these little bins in the corner there are used all over the country. And it's surprising that they aren't used in Vermont, but uh, the, the fishermen, uh, Mike, you could speak to that just a little bit. They, they do get used, don't they? But the, sometimes the fish lines break, the, the monofilament lines break, and they and birds get tangled up in them. And even if they're thrown in the trash, when the trucks dump the trash in the, wherever they dump it, the birds flock around that, as you know, and, and feed, and they get tangled up in these filaments. So up until we put these together last year, they were the only place you could have lower bins were uh, places like Dick's Sporty Goods, and, and the fishermen would bring their, their lines in there. So they, so we redesigned the ones that we saw. West of the Mississippi, they're very popular, but even in New Jersey and down south, they're all over the place by the thousands, and they just aren't in Vermont. But the state of Vermont actually asked for the plans, so I put together the plans that we just might be seeing more of them. So this flips up, and uh, it can only, I put it, it is, we designed it so that the lid could only go up so high so it would automatically come down and close, because people were putting, we, 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 from our stories that we would read, were putting, uh, junk in there, you know, yeah. trash. So uh, we had very, very little trash with us. Do you want to say, Mike? Right? Yep. An occasional bottle cap or maybe a cigarette. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was very successful. <laughs> and we're now collecting all that because we have an artist who wants to take all these uh, pieces of things that are somewhat very colorful so that she wants to do something with it, make them an art display. So, uh, 
I think we're going to leave it at that, and uh, Sheila's going to take over and, and, and tell us a story. All right, thank you. Eric, let me take your seat. Oh, yes. And be sure you speak up. Yes, I will speak up. And of course, Eric said that I have talent at doing these presentations, and of course, the first slide has a glitch in it. <laughs> because, because this is a Mac system, and the Mac system didn't read my PowerPoint correctly. So that's the worst one. There are two other little tiny ones that hopefully you won't even notice. So, well, Thank if you don't point it out to us, <laughs> I won't. I won't, won't point it out. That one is so obvious, and I'm so glad you're here tonight. Much better to be here than on the reservoir tonight, quite right. frankly. And just, um, you know, one thing I, I forgot to mention: there's some handouts up here, including uh, we have some of, of the maps in black and white. This I is the. Yep. Are you the so, so if you don't have one of these maps, you're welcome to go up and pick one up and kind of follow Sheila through yep. the, the, the journey here. Yep. So while people are getting set, Eric explained a little bit who we are. And our mission statement is to protect, improve, and enhance the ecological, recreational, community values of the Waterbury Reservoir. Whoops, you know what? That was our starting slide. This is our starting slide. <laughs> it's set up. That's um, one of our local osprey that I saw about two weeks ago on the reservoir. And he's welcoming you, because this time of year, they will loudly welcome you when they see you. So the reservoir is 860 acres in the summer. Water levels do vary, so the size will vary a little bit. Six miles long, and has about 18 miles of shoreline. And what is around it is the Mount Mansfield State Forest, 37,000 acres. So that's why the area around it is, is also a precious resource. So on your maps, what we're going to do is we're going to take a clockwise tour around the reservoir. And we're going to start at the dam, the Waterbury Dam, and where there's a access there. And this is the Waterbury Dam, and obviously without the dam, there would be no reservoir. We would have the Waterbury mud hole. And the dam itself is almost 1,900 feet long and is 187 feet high. And anyone that's taken one of the dam tours that are periodically offered can really get a chance to see this. It's really a fascinating structure. And I am not an engineer, but I am amazed, and I am certainly amazed at this. So we all know about the flood in 1927, which drove the people to the roofs, and it was less than 10 years later. The CCC and the Army Corps of Engineers constructed the dam that made the reservoir. The CCC camp had more 80 buildings, 2,000 men as a memorial to some men who died in a tragic incident. Um, and you see that as you're going up the road towards the Little River State Park, that monument is there. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that because where's Judy? I understand next week you're going to have a right. whole presentation focused say. on the fascinating history of the CCC camp. So, but, but that is, we consider that as part of the reservoir. The trails of the old campgrounds for the CCC. Yes. A third have been completed. Oh, excellent. And this summer, they're going to do the other two thirds. Fantastic. Yep, yeah, that's Thank great. Thank you, Ian. She's amazing, by the way. Yeah, that it's, just increases the number of trails and user friendly areas around the reservoir. So, this is, you don't have to read all that, but essentially, what that's important for people to know is that. The dam has undergone a risk assessment. There's a report that's coming out probably this year or next year. And sometime within the next three to five years, repairs are going to have to be made and the dam is going to have to be lowered. Okay. Now, how much, how degree, and for how long, hopefully it won't be a complete drain like was done you know, 20 years ago. Um, but they do have to make the repairs. There'll be advance notice to everybody about that. There, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Army Corps of Engineers, they will hold public events to inform people who have already held, had held some to show this process for assessing the dam. And obviously, if the dam is re being repaired and the water level has to go down, that may affect some of the recreation on the reservoir, some of the campsites, some of the state parks. But that's still kind of in flux because they're still planning on what repairs, how long they're going to take. So it's a process. Um, one thing that's interesting is 
the state of Vermont owns this dam, all right? And you may have all heard or seen the information about the controversy over the Green River Reservoir Dam. One big difference is the Waterbury Reservoir Dam has the U.S. Corps of Engineers involved in the maintenance, repair, and all that. Green River has no Army Corps of Engineers. has nothing to do with the Green River Dam. It's just more spill water and light. So that make, that's a big difference. So you really can't compare the two situations. And so from the dam, we're going to head northwest to Little River State Park. And Little River State Park is very large, very popular, but it's a lovely campground. I've, been, I've stayed there, even living you know, 10 miles down the road. I've stayed there early season and late season. It's very pretty. It has you know, tents, RV sites, lean twos, and five cabins, which a lot of the state parks have gone to now. You know, four walled and closed little cabins. They're really cute. So the trails around the state park, which also in this generally consider the um, CCC camp trails, they're popular with hikers and mountain bikers. And if you take the trails up towards the old Ricker farm and things like that, you can see the old cemeteries, the old cellar holes. Um, if people don't steal them, you know, some of the old bottles and household implements that are found are left on the stone walls. And that was from the early 1800s. And what's interesting is the trails that are up there now, it's an amazing system of mountain bike trails up there now. It's at, in the last five to six years, it's absolutely incredible what the Waterbury Area Trails Alliance has done. But it's not for free. You know, they're getting grants, they work. If a mountain biker wants to quit and use those trails, they have to get a pass from the state park. And they have to park in a designated area. So it's a cooperative effort between the state parks and the mountain bikers. The mountain bikers aren't just taking advantage of this great environment without a cost. And it's a really good relationship between the two. Waterbury Area Trails Association is a really responsible organization. So we're going to leave the state park area. We're going to go north along the western shore of the reservoir. We're going to go past where the no wing zone markers are. So the no, from Little River State Park north, there's I don't know how many tenths of a mile. Power boats can still go at whatever speed is safe, I guess. <laughs> but once they hit those no wake zone markers, north of that, they cannot create a wake when they're traveling. So, and beyond that is where we're going to find, we're going to start seeing the remote campsites, which are paddle in only campsites, paddle in or boat in. You also might see one of the floating rangers. And the floating rangers, that's Chad Ummel. Chad Ummel, many of you know him, have been out there. He's moved up the ladder in the state parks. He's now an assistant regional director. And Ben Bolton, mm -hmm. who was Chad's assistant last year, is now going to be in charge of the floating rangers, the remote campsite rangers. And you might see a little mink mm -hmm. hiding along the shoreline. Waterbury Reservoir is one of the places where Every year, at least once or twice, I'll see a little mink. If they sit, actually sit still long enough, I can actually get a picture. <laughs> and this is a campsite, the northern end. This happens to be one of my favorite campsites because it's kind of tucked in and it's, it's very close to the water and is right across from where the eagles hang out. So there's Judy's friend. She might not remember him. Maybe she's forgotten it, but anyway. So what's amazing about the campsites is anyone that's been out there and, or even knows that geography of the reservoir, there's a ledge on some sides of that, steep, steep ledge. And every campsite now has a moldering privy at the campsite. People that used to camp out there before the state took over the campsites, you may remember the disgusting, vile, unhygienic mess in the woods behind the rocks, behind the tree, up in the tree. It was disgusting. <laughs> so it's been, you know, obviously they didn't build them all. 28 campsites, I think. Um, it was a gradual process, but I think two years ago they finished the last one, which involved the Youth Conservation Corps going up a ledge. And at Site 15, it's quite a climb up to the privy. Okay? Chad used to call it 
Machu Picchu, because that's what I call it, Machu Picchu, to get up. This is the one at 16, which is my site, where you, it's kind of a, you have a lovely little traverse. You go back there, <laughs> it takes about eight minutes to get up there. So you have to time things really well. <laughs> but, it, but they do have walls. They do have a roof. And any of us who have camped at Green River know that you have the lovely thrones with a view, shall we say. <laughs> No walls, no roof. So now we're going to come up to the landslide area. Just anyone that's you know, been in Waterbury area or around the reservoir for the past few years knows the landslide area has heard of it. When a heavy rain event in May, early June of 2019, some mountain bikers were hiking up beyond Foster's Trail, and suddenly the mountain was sliding, the hillside was sliding down next to them. And at least three acres of earth slid into the reservoir of the Cotton Brook Delta. Used to be a nice little, but Cotton Brook came in, and there was a nice shoreline. Campsite was there that came out on a peninsula. Peninsulas are all gone now. So ANR has been doing studies. Immediately went out, did studies, um, did aerial photos, did aerial photos, and this is some of them. And what you don't get here is the perspective, because that's three acres of mud just sliding down. You think of the pictures you see in Hawaii of the volcanoes with the lava pouring down. It was like that, but it was mud. Thick, glutinous, sticky clay mud. Taking okay, trees, wildlife, um, you know, all the ground cover, rocks, rocks that couldn't move, boulders, all got tumbled down to the reservoir. This is my dog, and what all that area, this was about a week after the, la the landslide, that is all mud and all used to be water. And it was completely mud, and the water, it was like paddling through coffee. It was just so thick and so mud. You could you'd paddle through and you'd pick up your paddle, and the mud was coating your paddle. <laughs> this is an, air, you know, an aerial picture that A&R took with their drone. And all that mud, this, you can see all the way out, around and down, that was all reservoir, that was all water. And then that summer 2019, it was nothing but a big mud hole. This is a picture I took again about a week, about two weeks after the landslide with my canoe. And normally the reservoir width in that section was from A to C. But when I paddled that day, it was A to B. And you couldn't get through with a powerboat because it was about that deep. It was like I'd get stuck occasionally and have to pull my canoe through. But that was how narrow it got. But nature heals itself. And even for the, for the summer of 2020 and 2021, it was really soft, that delta. And you may have seen, if you were out there, a big sign that Chad had to put up, keep off. <laughs> Because even though it wasn't technically quicksand, it had the same function as quicksand. People were stepping in it sinking and not being able to get their feet up. It was so soft and so gooey. And, but now the delta has grown up. This was, I think, in 2020, 21. This was two year, 2020, two years ago, where the, the end of the year where the grass was just starting to grow up a year after the landslide. And basically, it used to be reservoir there, but now at least it's not a big mud hole. And growth is coming up, and the birds love it. Um, I've seen so much wildlife in there. And there also now is, once again, you can see the river, or the cotton brook. You can't paddle up all the way, you can't paddle very far, because you get up and it gets too shallow. But you can at least see where the brook feeds into the river. It's more clearly defined. It has a peninsula on one side and a peninsula on the other that didn't used to be there. But now it's a much more natural flow of the brook down into the reservoir. So this Cotton Brook End, the northern end of the reservoir, is full of wildlife. And it has no campsites within that circle. The farthest north campsite on the western shore is number 19. And the eastern side, it's number 18. And beyond that, there's no campsites. And that's where the wildlife hang out. I saw that bear when I was camping about two years ago. 
Just walking across, right across the landslide area. <laughs> there he goes, happy as to be. And just north of Site 19, there's a big bank. And I couldn't, I couldn't manage to save it clear enough. But when the reservoir was drained about 20 years ago, it, the water was about six feet you know, down to that was, was, was ground. And we have a picture of my son, who was about eight at the time, standing with his mountain bike, like what would now be eight feet underwater, mm -hmm. that same spot. Uh, because that's what would turn around. We'd go out to the big landslide and turn around. But that slide now, and there's even more, I saw it the other day, trees that have crumbled down on it. But it's a pretty cool slide because the snapping turtles will crawl up that. And it's almost vertical. And they'll go up 10, 12 feet. When they see, whoop, they'll slide right down. The painted turtles will hang out the lower section. And northern ruffling swallows, if you look, sometimes you'll see the little holes where they go in to do their little nesting. And even the belted kingfishers apparently will nest in there. I have not seen a belted kingfisher come out of a hole there, but I've seen many belted kingfishers on all the dead trees that hang down in that area. So the northern end is unfortunately the area where it's most obvious that the reservoir is facing an issue with brittle naiad, which is an invasive species. And as the summer goes along, you realize when you're paddling the northern end, it's harder and harder to drag your paddle through the water because you're dragging it through. I call it vegetable paddling because you're pad or salad paddling because you're going through all the foliage. It's just growing and just taking over the area under the surface of the water. We're going to talk a little bit about the invasive species in a little bit. So this is a great blue heron, which is our logo. He's a great blue heron. This guy caught himself a little fish when I was watching him. And herons are considered an indicator species. And an indicator species is a species that tells you if a water body is healthy. So the fact that we have great blue herons is a good sign. Just as I was coming in, was anyone listening to BPR and hearing the story about the river otters in, in the Detroit? For the first time ever, a guy got a picture of a river otter in the Detroit River, which was amazing because river otters will only live where water is clear. I see them here all the time. So for that, it's an indicator species. The river otter is also an indicator species. That if you see river otters, that water is going to be clean. They're not going to live in polluted, crappy, dirty water. So, but we like the herring because that's our, the great blue herring, because that's our, uh, it, our logo. And there are over 50 bird species can be seen on the reservoir. I've seen about 35 of them. Any of you know Liz Lackey, the birding expert from Stowe? She's fantastic. She does her, her loom watch every year which is third Saturday of July every year. Every water body that has loons in it in the state, volunteers go out and count loons and count loon chicks. And she does our Waterbury Reservoir one because I do the loon watch at Green River. So she's done it for many years, even you know, before our urbanization. And last year, I think she detected, she doesn't just count loons because she's an expert birder. She counts every other bird. And she counted over 46 birds in a two hour period on a Saturday morning in July. And one of the species, which is pretty cool, I don't have a picture of it, for the first time ever, she had seen a, found a marsh wren in the Waterbury Reservoir up at the Cottonbrook End. And I heard about that, I was all excited, because so now my search was to find a, a marsh wren. So I listened to it, I listened to the sound it makes on my eBird account so I'd get familiar with it. I went out about two weeks after that, and I was paddling in the marshy areas, and I said, I hear it. I hear, I hear a marsh wren. I hear a marsh wren, but I have to see it to believe it. I don't trust my auditory identification skills. Sure enough, there in some grasses, sitting upside down with this big you know, wren tail going up and down, was a marsh wren. I got a picture of it, a video clip of it, and I sent it to Liz, and she was, yes, you found him. I'm like, yes! <laughs> so I can check that lifer off. <laughs> Um, we have eagles at the northern end. We've had a pair. We have a juvenile. Um, this year, I've only seen one of the adults and one juvenile. In years past, I've seen two mature adults and a juvenile. Um, 
So I'm worried that our other eagle might have caught avian flu or something. Uh, but I'll keep watching. We have green herons, which are one of my favorite birds. Osprey, this time of year especially, they're quite popular. The bird, anyone know what the bird on the right is? Take a guess. Be brave. It's a bald eagle. It's an immature bald eagle. And, and we have them, but this is a quite a young one. He's still a lot of brown, no white, hardly at all. She was, I think, a year and a half. She had a little green band on her leg. Yeah. And under that, is, and the other one has a silver band. And the silver band is a federal band. The green band, I looked it up, meant that she was tagged in New Jersey. Mm. And I, my camera, I don't have a super zoom or anything, so I couldn't get like any numbers off it. But I sent the best pictures I could to Margaret Fowle, our, bird, our eagle expert in Vermont, because I hadn't heard back from the New Jersey people because it, my email probably just went in their spam folder. But she got in touch with them, and the people from New Jersey told me that it's a female. She was banded in New Jersey like a year and a half before I took this picture. I think it was about a year and a half, a little a year and four months, something like that. And they sent me a video clip because when she was hatched and fledged, they had a camera, a bird cam on the nest. So I was able to see this bird being yeah. <laughs> hatched. But I haven't seen her since. I'm always looking for banded birds. And then we also have mammals. We don't just have birds and reptiles and things like that. So we have porcupines. And very often, we see the deer. You can't quite see it in that picture, but there was a fawn right behind her. And this is the time of year when I go out, I expect that I will see the fawns with the does. I've seen them swimming across the reservoir. Mama leading the little baby, little baby. So, 2019, another exciting moment for me was I was paddling out at Cotton Brook and I looked over and I said, oh my God, there's a loon on a nest. We have, there, have ne there has never been, until this time, a documented case of a loon nesting on the Waterbury Reservoir. So I took pictures. <laughs> and the reason that loons have not been successful in the Watery Reservoir is that fluctuation in the water level. Because, because of their anatomy, loons have to nest close to the water. Their feet are way back on their body. If you've ever seen a, I have a video, but I didn't, didn't put it on there. If you've ever seen a loon trying to walk on land, it's pretty funny. It's pretty cartoonish, actually. They're not built for land, they're built for water. So they have to nest close to the water, which makes problematic on a reservoir. So this loon, I was so excited, I got in touch with Eric Hansen, who's the state, any of you may have seen any presentations from him the state director of the loon program, and he sent her the picture. He's like, yes, yes, watch that nest, watch that nest. Of course, within a week, we had torrential rains, which led to the landslide, and the nest was gone. So that August, Eric suggested that maybe we could set out a loon raft. Even though it was after the nesting season for loons, they tend to nest, they'll start, they're starting to pick out the nest spots now. And by the end of May, they'll be nesting, they'll hatch, and by the 4th of July, usually the chicks are born, 28 day uh, incubation time. But, and this was in August, by the time we got to it. But he said, at least let's get it out there. The loons can kind of get used to the fact that it's there, because the loons are still around. And a loon raft is basically a square of big timbers with wire mesh, the same mesh that's used for lobster traps, put over the top of it, with flotation underneath, anchored down with cinder blocks. And onto that platform, Eric and Francine and I helped Eric Hansen. We put mud on it, we put moss on it, we put trees on it, we basically planted it to make it a lovely little marshy island for the loons. And every year, we have to go out in the spring because of the water levels and the ice in the reservoir, we can't leave ours out in the water. We have to pull it onto shore. And we have to get out and do the messy, wet, muddy job of dragging this thing back out, replanting it, getting it in position. And that was two seasons ago, wasn't it? That was in 2019 yeah. we did that. Yeah, and then this year, Mike Abar joined the Mike group. joined us this year. Wasn't it fun? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he had, his he had his waders on. I had my dry suit because someone's going to get wet. 
You know, someone has to go in the water and get wet. We have not had the loons nest on it yet. In 20 or 21, we haven't had them nest on it. I have a, we put the signs, people are in the water seeing the signs that say loon nesting area, please stay away. We put those out around it. And I have a picture of the loons swimming around the signs that say <laughs> loons nest here, stay away. And, I, and I'm yelling at the loons, no loons, over there. <laughs> and then last year, I go out and 100 feet from the loon nest is essentially the same little marshy island where they tried to nest before. And I look over, and the two loons are mating. Oh, oh, there. And I'm like, no, no loons. You're not in the right spot. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we move the raft over, just thinking, well, they kind of like that area, apparently. <laughs> Suits their needs or something. But they didn't. So this year, we, when we positioned it, we positioned it closer to where they first nested and kind of in the general area where they were mating last year and out of the main flow of traffic. If you paddle out or boat out from Cottonbrook, you know when you get out past the channel where the river comes in, you have that narrow section where this marshy island is on your left as you're paddling out, marsh on the right. You didn't want the nest in there, even though the loons might like it there, because there's just so much traffic and we couldn't put the signs up. So it's out, and we're just keeping our fingers and web feet crossed. <laughs> so then at the far end of the reservoir is the Moscow Paddlers Access Area, which the state, again, in conjunction with Green Mountain Power and the management plan, for the lovely improve the access area, improve the parking, improve the, uh, the, it's just a kayak and canoe access, no powerboat access. They improved it very nice, but we do get high water events in the reservoir. And on the right, you can see that same kiosk mm -hmm. with water wow. up to about here. Yeah. I mean, I paddled in from the cornfield <laughs> where the whole road is flooded. And I put the canoe in on the road and paddle in on the road. When it gets, I think it was that day, it was my guess that I did that. So then we've gone up and we're going to head back now. You know, we were up to the far northern end. And we're heading back south, and it gets a little broader. Still some campsites scattered around. We might see some of the fishermen. This is actually the area where I am most likely to run into fishermen. And they might be looking for rainbow trout, brown trout, smallmouth bass, bullhead, yellow perch, any sort of other, probably other things too, Mike. And these are some of the fishermen <laughs> that you might see out there. Michael, can you identify the fish for us? I hope I can. OK. Uh, my, my wife. The two ones that my wife has are smallmouth bass, uh, very representative. There are bigger ones there. There are five pounders in, in, in the reservoir, not that they're frequent. And the one that I'm, uh, is a beautiful brown trout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's beauty. That was caught just down from the dam. If people recognize there are the cliffs over there. But that was actually cheating a little bit because some of the, that, that fish was caught not illegally, it was caught after the season that you can't take them. So that fish was it went released. Right back. But those are the, the Fish and Wildlife Department. They have uh, trophy fish that sometimes they, they stock. They're brood fish that are too old you know, to keep in the uh, hatcheries. And sometimes they stock. And we just happened to be there the day that the guy was uh, <laughs> stocking. So and they were all hungry. It was, oh, yeah. They After were their trip. Hungry. They, they didn't hesitate to bite on anything. And then I'm not sure what Mr. Loon has, but I've seen Loon eat bigger fish than that on the reservoir. Yeah. And has anyone here, any else here seen a Loon eat a big like fish? A fish. Yeah. Little fish, they just, you know, pop down, whatever. But a big fish, they basically, they dive underwater and they shred it. And then they come up, they go under and eat some more. They basically shred the fish as they're going along. But there have been loon that have died from choking on a fish that's too big. Oh. <laughs> so. Chew your food slowly. Exactly. <laughs> but if you ever see them going at it, they don't slow. And you come up, and then they come up, and they got peace. And every now and then, they'll, I'll see them fighting with the fish, and the fish is still fighting back. <laughs> that doesn't usually last very long, though. That's why it's so important. Oh. oh no, go ahead. Oh. That's why it's so important that um, I don't know how many years. It must be close to 20 years ago 
that the state of Vermont banned uh, the use of the uh, lead, lead, lead. lead split shot and sinkers and stuff oh, like yeah. that, anything Good. less than a quarter ounce. Right. Because okay. what a lot of things is loons and ducks and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the bids, but there was, it was just, I was just hearing Eric Hansen talk last week on BPR, and if a loon eats one little tiny lead sinker, it's dead. It, it yeah. cannot survive. And of course, they're, you know, they're fish and they'll feed off the bottom and they eat other, other fish that have been caught, whatever. So they're going to get that and it it's kills them. And I found three dead loons in the past five years. Thankfully, none of them were lead poisoning. They died from uh, the fungal infection that loons get. So concretions. Oh, yeah. Who's heard of concretions? Cool. Oh, we got something to hand around. I need them back, though. Yeah, we need them back. Mm -hmm. one, of the one looks like Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is just like a blob. I think that These blob look is mine. A little bit like. Oh, well, we don't talk about We don't talk about what it looks like. <laughs> Are there any children in them? But they're, um, they're, it looks like somebody might have carved them. Yep. So, do you, do you know where to find them on the reservoir? If you know what they are, do you know where to find them? Well, okay. This is where you find them. What the concretion? What it is? It's a, obvious. It's hard. It's compact, and it's a mat. It's a massive matter, and it's that big hillside. Okay, kind of diagonally southeast of the uh, Little River State Park. That big sandy hillside over there. And what happens is it's it's just this chemical process that happens with the minerals, the sand water, the rainwater, the sand, and the pressure that gets put on there creates these amazing shapes. So if you go out to that, every now and then you'll see, if you go out there, you'll see kids climbing up in there. And I think they're just climbing because it's a fun big sand hill. I don't think they know what they might find. But that's a pretty cool thing. And I don't know, it's the only place I know around in Vermont, I don't know, I suppose there are other places in Vermont where it could be found. I find them in my garden. Oh, cool, OK. Down in the village. The, because something about the same kind of soil and the same kind of environmental circumstances. Yeah, so often I'm sure they just get, you know, kids looking for cool stuff, they just get tossed aside because they just think it's a rock. But I think they're pretty cool. So now we're at the elephant rock. And elephant rock, it's a pretty characteristic projection of rock onto the reservoir, essentially almost right under the power lines that go across from Blush Hill to Greg Hill. And it is a designated day use of the state park. So people can paddle in. People can also walk in from Greg Hill Road, but they're not allowed to camp there. And for many years, it was that was a big problem because it was a site for many a wild, crazy party and, you know, um, long-term camping and you know bad bad situ bad scene whatever and of course the folks that live on Greg Hill Road have to deal with the parking and the cars and the noise and the trash and the litter and the debris. Um, I use it a lot of times in the winter just for a fun snowshoe just a quick half hour snowshoe up Tell Rock um, and it's really pretty and it's very quiet in the off season you know no one's around the reservoir is quiet you can hike out there, um, and it's completely empty. But in the summer, it is a crazy busy spot between the swimmers and the people jumping up and the picnickers and the kayakers and the paddlers and the power boats going through that narrow stretch of the reservoir. So one of our concerns as an organization is safety for all users on the reservoir, not just paddlers, not just stand-up paddle boarders, power boaters, swimmers, water skiers. You know, someone, if, if someone's towing their 12-year-old kid on a, water, a wa boat, the kid's water skiing, you don't want that boat to suddenly have to you know, steer to avoid a paddler or something like that, because that would, could endanger the safety of the kid skiing behind the boat. So we really try to emphasize safety. Not, we try not to preach, but obviously any safety messages we sometimes can come across as preaching. What we try to emphasize is that the reservoir is for everyone, and that if everyone calms down, <laughs> takes it easy, and thinks before they act, 
and tries to respect the existing rules, whether it's the 200 foot rule that power boats have to follow, not creating a wake or within a boat, or whether it's swimmers that we put together some posters and some information last year for swimmers to remind them when swimmers are swimming from Elephant Rock to the Deus area, or from Blush Hill to the Deus area, that they're crossing a motorboat area, and that maybe they should wear a bright orange um, swim cap, or tow a swim buoy behind them, or have a paddler with them, some way to let them be visible, because it's their safety. We're worried about their safety. So now we end up, after we go to Elder Rock, where a lot of people originated, which was Waterbury Center State Park, which is very busy. And one of the things that Francine might be able to address this, I have not, when you leave Elephant Rock and head up towards the state park, on that far shoreline, if the water is clear, which since the landslide, it's been hard to be really clear, the conditions have to be just right. In the shallow water there, you can see foundations and yeah. remnants of the buildings that there, were there before the reservoir. Yeah. There's a little cove over just past Elephant Rock. If you tuck in there, the water's fairly shallow, so you don't see motorboats in there. But if you're on a paddleboard or a kayak, you're will, really within a few feet of uh, foundations of the original farms that were there. And it's and when you're when it was. We, when it was drained in 2000, you could see where all the roads were, the bridges were, and that if you follow those, the foundations are really close to where the roads were, because people didn't like to plow back then. <laughs> so, so they always built their houses very close to the roads. So it's fascinating. If you have a chance to go out there and just take, take time to really look under the water, you'll see it. And you can see uh, streams coming in there. and. Yeah. There are also uh, some pretty good sized bridge abutments when there, when there was a road going, the road from came from Waterbury Hill. Center right through and over to the, over the, the campground. Over to Blush so, Hill, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So in the state park, is you know, very busy. And on the right, we have Eric and Walter Carpenter, the ranger from the Waterbury Center State Park. What are they holding? Well, they're holding one of our fish line recycling bins. The infamous oh, yeah. of Walter He's here. And this is the monofilament fishing line recycling bins, and they'll be all five, five access areas this year. We only had them at three last year. We're going to add it to the dam, and we're going to add one at the Little River State Park boat access for the campers there. And we have labels on them, and we have information signs for the fishermen above, and the people, just to remind them why, because the fishing line you know, it's to protect our wildlife. And the sign that actually goes above, you know, explains that there's an entanglement hazard um, and we were trying to protect our, our birds and our mammals too. And Sheila, didn't, didn't the chat actually untangle? Well, the, the reason, right, we started it last year because the year before, Ranger Chad Amal had got a call about a cormorant that was entangled in fishing line. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know anyone that loves cormorants. They're pretty good for pictures because they sit still. But, you know, they're kind of, we call them a trash bird, you know. <laughs> but they're a beautiful bird when they want to be a beautiful bird. But whatever you think about cormorants, no bird should be left to starve to death because its beak is entangled in fishing line. You know, that's, that's just not right. So Chad went out with a big net and managed to catch the cormorant, who wasn't very happy, and managed to get the fishing line untangled. Now, my experience paddling all over the Northeast and in Canada, I was aware of the danger of fishing line. And in fact, every year, if I find bobbers or lines or sinkers, I collect everything I find. And at the end of the year, I usually have a tackle box full of stuff that I've collected because it's a danger to the wildlife and the birds. So we knew that a bird had already gotten entangled and the cormorant was our test case, but in the future it could be one of our bald eagles, it could be one of our loons, it could be one of our green heron, or our, you know, mallards or our wood ducks. So all birds, they deserve to be able to fish and perch in the trees and raise their young without the danger of being entangled in fishing line. And though the bins are designed for the monofilament fishing line because of the danger it presents, and because of the fact that it doesn't rot away, it goes to the landfill and other birds can get into it. We also found people putting discarded lures, broken bobbers, hooks, leaders, 
sinkers in the bin. You know that's not the purpose. We weren't complaining about that at all. Because if those sinkers and the leaders were in our recycling bin, they weren't on the ground where some moon was going to eat them. So the Waterway Center State Park is a great starting point for all the water activities. Kayak or stand-up paddle boarding is really big there. There's a group that does stand-up paddle board yoga. <laughs> I, 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 I guess you got to have some good balance for that. <laughs> and be a little younger than I am. <laughs> and then, if you're really lucky at the Day East area, you can see the amazing athletes from the Northeast Disabled Athletic Association in action. Has anyone seen them and what they can do? Yeah. They are. It is amazing. Kathy Webster's program, they're based primarily at Waterbury Center, the Day Use area. But they have started branching out. They come to Green River a couple times a year. They go to other lakes a couple times a year. No one gets turned away. It doesn't matter what your level of disability, what your level of motor function or motor challenge you have is, Kathy will find a way to put you in a kayak and have you out enjoying the water. Mm -hmm. And so, Drew Bressel takes the pictures for them, and she shared these with us. I'm just curious, why don't they just sit on top kayaks? It seems like it would be, if someone's disabled, it would be You know, easier. for some people, they might. Yeah. They might, but a lot of these folks, it, they, it's a wide range of challenges from folks that have had strokes that may only have mo movement on one side of their body to folks that are paraplegic, that have extremely limited motion, and it's all the kayaks are adapted with outriggers, um, paddle assist so that the paddle sits on a frame basically, and the person can do a complete kayak paddle with just this much motion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's absolutely amazing. And there's a whole system for getting the folks in and out of the boat. Um, but that's a good question, Mike. And I don't, I, th this is what, you know, Kathy uses. But it seems I, it would just be natural. It would be easy for someone to, <clears throat> maybe there's some disability you'd want the, you right. know, you know the, the enclosure, the, the, right. The enclosure, but I would think someone, you know, who, you know, was paralyzed, it would just be easier to sit. On. Yeah, Kathy, you know, Get out there sometime when they're out there. I think it's Tuesdays and Thursday mornings they're out there, I think. Get out there, watch them, and ask Kathy. She's glad. fantastic. She's, she's great. She's the woman in the pink tank top. Oh. So when we leave the day this area, we head over back towards the Blush Hill boat access, and we pass by the water ski slalom course, which is set up by the Green Mountain Water Skiers. And I've only seen them a couple times. Um, if I paddle from Blush Hill, it's usually about 6 in the morning. But that's when they start coming out early in the morning because they like a nice, calm, quiet water. So it makes sense for them to come out early. And the Blush Hill access was completely rebuilt a few years ago, um, such as the dam access was and the Cottonbrook access was as part of the agreement of Green Mountain Power with the state and with the management plan for the whole <coughs> reservoir. They really improved it. It's really nice, but it still draws thousands and thousands and thousands of people every year. <coughs> And the traffic jams on the narrow roadway between you know, the big boats and the trailers and people trying to turn around and the people with their kids in their kayaks trying to get out. It's, it's, not, a good, it's not the best situation. We're aware of that. We, are, we always hear about that. It's a town road. It's not, a, it's not part of the state park system. But state park works with the town to put a porta potty there. And, you know, help with other things, and the greeter program is there. Um, the town is the town has plans to do a increased parking area up there. They're in the process on the Blush Hill area. Uh, they it's already gone through the DRB for the additional, additional parking, parking yep. which should hopefully alleviate right. a little bit. Of the we right. just got the permit last week, didn't we? Right. Like yeah. So, I mean, the town has been aware for a number of years. If they put signs up that say no parking, what do we think? Ha what happens to the signs? They get torn down or they get shot up. So, <laughs> so everyone is aware of that. It's not an ideal situation, but, but the improvement over the access is really nice. Mm -hmm. And Blush Hill is our, one of our primary sites for the invasive species greeter program. We talked about the brutal naiad at the northern end. Um, but our greeter program primarily is at Blush Hill, but also a little bit sometimes at the dam, and hopefully this year with some additional people and with our intern, we can increase our presence. And the greeters have the signs. They're there usually on weekends, busy times, so that boats coming in to the reservoir 
we know where they've been. If they've been at a lake that has Eurasian milfoil or another invasive species, you're going to want to know that and want to check that. Um, they also will check boats coming out of our reservoir to make sure that our boaters aren't transporting brittle naiad or anything else that might show up in the reservoir to other water bodies. And the greeters have had as many as 800 interactions with boaters during the season. And that's just on weekends. You know, it's not, it's eight to 10 hours a week, so, you know, total probably. And every boater doesn't get interacted because obviously if four boaters are coming down, the greeter's dealing with one, the others aren't gonna wait usually. They're gonna want to win. Most people are, most people are good. Okay, thank you. Most people are really good, apparently, according to Zach Johnson. Um, and even though brittle naiad is what we find in ours, some of the other curly pond leaf, curly leaf pond weed and some of the Eurasian water milfoil has been found on boats that were headed to our reservoir. So we want to get those before they get in our reservoir. So now we're going to head back to the dam <laughs> under the view of Camel's Hump and Bolton. Back to our starting point, which basically is at the dam and the dam access. And now our tour is complete. So we hope you can get out and enjoy your own actual trip around this great local resource. We'll see you out there. Is that a real frog? That's a, great <laughs> That's a real frog, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a cotton book, actually. Oh, and, an otter. and the otter. I love seeing the otters on the reservoir. Mm -hmm. I love, they don't like seeing me all the time, but I love seeing them. So we, any, any questions or comments or anything? Anything? Make sure, you know, if you can come so, to the presentation of the CC camp next week, I'd highly recommend it. So yeah, that's um, Wednesday the 25th, next Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, Marty Podscotch is from Connecticut, and he's written a couple of books, one on the Adirondacks and one on CC camps in uh, Connecticut. And uh, Anne's been great with giving me a ton of information, and he's like a kid in a candy store. The next book is going to be Vermont, so he's just thrilled. Um, but anyway, he's been wonderful to deal with. Uh, I should say deal with, to interact with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so come out. He's a, he's a historian and a retired teacher and loves nothing more than to talk about um, just the, the CCC camps. And Waterbury was the largest. 30, Vermont has 30 of them. Um, and, and Waterbury was the largest. So we know about the dam and the other. Um, was right down here. Uh, where the uh, swimming pool and the tennis courts yeah, are, right. and I didn't even realize yeah. that until Marty told me. Marty from Connecticut. Yes, Anne. He was looking for a picture of that, but we have one upstairs. It's this wall. Right. I took a picture of that, and it, it was a glare and everything. But he's coming next Wednesday at noon, and so he'll we'll be up. Yeah, we'll be. Not. We'll yeah. be up. There. Yeah. So anyway, please do come to that presentation. It should be a lot of fun. Yes. So this, this presentation is going to be Orca Media. Orca Media. And how will people access it? <laughs> I will send the information. OK. Yeah. All right. We will so, have it up on our website on the after, yeah, website. after um, uh, um, Gilberto does, does his, his work okay. and such. Um, right. And then it will be on their website as well. Right. So, so it's two websites. And then, yeah. and then um, it will be on our um, website for Friends of Waterbury Reservoir and also hopefully we'll get it on our Facebook page within the next week which is Friends of Waterbury Reservoir is a type of Facebook. Yes? Have you seen any fisher cats up that way at all? Oh boy. I have not but I've heard them. Well I know. I, 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 what I believe I've heard them. That pretty distinct. I, I live in Mountain Drive and right behind us in that the woods up there yeah. there's a pair of fisher cats up there. A pair? They're probably Screaming oh, quite a bit. Yeah. 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 Pretty, pretty we have yeah. the coyotes. Did I get to say Oh, something? yeah, the coyotes. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Really been we've got some business cards up on the desk. If anybody has questions, you can contact the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. Yeah. Anything from when the dam is going to be maybe lowered, when the water is going to be lowered, to what's out there, events, whatever. So uh, feel free to take that and anything else that you want. To I did want to. Oh, oh go ahead. Hey, a question here. Years ago, they I took a tour on a pontoon boat of the reservoir. Whatever happened to that? I'm not sure who was doing it. Oh, I know we've I seen remember. pontoon boats out there. I don't know if they actually. There's a fall foliage tour yeah. that. I think it was run by the 
It might have been. Might have been. There, there, well, 20 years ago, it would have been around the time they were doing the draining and, and refreshing it. You know, when it was refilled, maybe they did it. And there is a fellow who runs the, who runs the foliage tours. Who is it? The, the fishing, the fly fish from on. Bob, Bob Shannon, they do the very popular foliage boat tours. It's not a pontoon boat, but they do that. So, um, and I just wanted to really thank you guys so much for all of your hard work. Because I know before the organization started, you know, there was there were a ton of motorboats, and I'm not putting down motorboats to understand. Um, but there was a lot of um, I want to say I don't know is misuse the right word, but abuse and yeah, you know, yeah. and, and the so poor this organization. I've just been so blessed to have you guys um, amongst us and all the hard work you do, and I know so many other members. So. I just want to say kudos oh, thank and you. thank you so much. And thank you. And, yeah. and the only thing I'm going to do One more thing, Nikki. Uh, just so you didn't all know who the board members are, there are actually five of us here. Walt, who works over at the Day Use Area, is also on our board. Can you stand up, Walt? Hey, Walter, your picture's in there. We saw your picture. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Bond, if you don't know him, you should. <laughs> and then, of course, Eric, myself. And Sheila, and then this year, so the uh, just a quick shout out to the Invasive Species Greeter Program. So this program um, was started by the previous treasurer Chuck Kleteka, who many of you may know. And I took it over when I became treasurer a couple of years ago. We were able to grow it this year thanks to not only the grant from the ANR, but also some generous donations from other people in this community and outside of this community. So we will actually have three paid greeters on the reservoir. They'll be there weekends mostly. Our intern, Ashley, is going to, because she works locally in the weekends, she's going to do some greeting during the week, which will be the first time we have somebody doing that. And we'll see how much we're missing. I think we've been missing a lot of boats. Yeah. And uh, also, we also have another greeter who will be a volunteer with Ashley, and that's our beautiful daughter, Lamira, <laughs> and so she, she just took the training and she, she called me and says, Mom, this is going to be hard. There's a lot to this. <laughs> and uh, and it's, uh, it's a great program and it's a statewide program and a lot of the data we collect is incredibly important to the, um, to the state to really get a handle on the invasive species and where they are and where they're going in this, in this state. And so. If you see anyone out there with a bright yellow shirt that says greeter on the back, say <laughs> hi to them up. and <laughs> greet them and, and just be kind and understand that, that they're there to really help the whole community. And um, as I said, Ashley will be out there during the week and Mira will also be out there during the week. So we will have quite a, quite a presence, probably more than a lot of years ago. So anyway, that's it. Yes. Would you have contact information for the uh, national for this National Disability Athletic Association? Um, they do you do Facebook? No. Okay, I will. You know what? Write it down for you on one of our cards. On, on the Facebook page. But he doesn't do Facebook, Facebook. because we do a have a link to it. They have a great Facebook page because they post all their pictures. Do yeah. you want to just put your information on what you're looking for sure. and how to contact you? Sure. Thank I'll you. send you a link to the website. If we get your information, all right. <laughs> one, one last thing, I'd be remiss not to mention this. Uh, we do, this, all this stuff is not free. So we would love to, <laughs> love to have you all as, as members, you know, con contribute as little or as much as you can. We do get some grant money from the state of Vermont, which supports the greeter program. I know, you know, I've worked hard, you know, you know through the, Town of Waterbury, we get a thousand dollars from the town of Waterbury. And we do get some. Of the, we are supported by the town of Stowe, uh, exactly. five hundred dollars a year, which is great. And um, and then, as I said, we've been able to reach out. And uh, Lawson's Finest gave us a very nice. You know, we, we specifically asked to support the breeder program with them, and they were generous into that for us as well. And there are others that have just stepped up to the plate. So we're excited to see to get that program a little bit more robust this year and we'll hopefully get, we'll see some real results to that plan. But everyone's few dollars does add up. Yeah. You, you know, if you could donate five, ten, 
you know, we would love if you could donate 100, 500. <laughs> but again, it, if enough people, a lot of people use the reservoir, if everyone just gave a little bit, especially to keep all the invasives out of the uh, reservoir is so, so important because this is, I, as I think Eric and I always call it, the crown jewel of water. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that work? I, know. I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't have a smartphone, so I don't need that. Can I see so that? we actually, our business cards are here. We don't have phone numbers. It's easier. Uh, so there are a few of us monitors in that email. Mm -hmm. It's easier for us if you email your questions and your thoughts and your concerns and your thank yous to that email address. And I made that easier for me to transfer it to whoever can answer your question. It's she just wants to try to scan the QR code. If you wanted to donate, does this, it, oh, is yeah, this, this, does this work? This works. No. Well, it should. should. Okay. Or you can go to our website. Yeah. Okay. You know, this is our little swimming. I was afraid I was going to walk off. Oh, I'd be very upset. Thank you guys.